Hey, Jen, I'm going in the deck. Okay. Jenna? What? Book another trip. Travelers, we are back today with another video. We are talking about all the Disney hacks you need to know that nobody else is talking about for your upcoming trip to Walt Disney World. Yes. So we just got back from a week at Walt Disney World. We also did a day at Universal. So we're going to talk about what it was like, um, what the wait times were like, what the transportation was like, and what the crowds were like so that you can have a strategy going into your Walt Disney World vacation. So we're talking about all four Walt Disney World theme parks, Disney Springs, and stay tuned to the end because we will also uh, mention our day at Universal Studios as well. So starting off with our first day, uh, it was Magic Kingdom. We went to um, one of the cast members at the front desk of the Caribbean Beach and asked what what is was her suggestion about us getting to the parks because we had seen around the resort um, by our time on property already that they were recommending uh, or the buses started going to the park 45 minutes before park opening. And so she's, she basically said more or less that is accurate. However, we should plan accordingly because people will be getting a line significantly um, earlier right. than 45 minutes before park opening. Yeah, opens. she said... If you want to get to the park before it opens and guarantee that you were there before it opens to take a Lyft or an Uber. That was our plan going into the morning. Mm -hmm. However, um, the bu we woke up that morning and went to the bus line. And it well, you called. We were waiting for an Uber or a Lyft. You called the Lyft. We were oh, at right. the Lyft station and all of a sudden we saw like two Magic Kingdom buses so we, yeah, so way we sprinted. before... 45 minutes, it was not 45 minutes before park opened. This, this was, was like an hour and 15 before park opened yeah. and two buses showed up. So we were like, boom. Oh, and we canceled the lift. We ran over, we got on the bus. We were at Magic Kingdom like 15 minutes later and people were already in the park. Yeah. We were like, what? You so, said 45 minutes? What is happening? So we breezed through temp check, breezed through security, did our you know little thing in town square and on Main Street um, and then booked it right over to pirates and we walked on to pirates yeah. at 8 40 like a good 20 minutes before no park more opened? more than that Was it because earlier? we were almost on haunted mansion by the time the park opened so wild feeling like we there was yeah. literally nobody else in everybody Adventureland with us. headed to when people mine go train. to people go to mine train people go to splash uh, splash space <laughs> Splash Mountain and Space Mountain. Those are the three most popular. And immediately at Park Open, they have like hour plus wait times. Yeah. Everybody goes to those three. So we were like, well, what if while everybody's in those lines, we try to, to do multiple things? And by the time somebody got out of one of those lines from the morning, we had done uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, had breakfast, took photos with that... Uh, photo pass photographer by the castle and we're headed to jungle cruise at like 9 15 insane wild so, so do that to summarize the hack plan on getting to the parks before they open because guaranteed from our experience there will be people there will be letting people into the mm -hmm. park a significant amount of time before the right. open time yep and if you show up to the 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 overall takeaway from this video if you show up to the park for the time the park opens you are late and you missed out. Right. <laughs> but that was just that was just transportation. Yeah. <laughs> to Magic Kingdom. But we also need to talk about wait times and general crowds. What do you remember about the crowds? The, it wasn't the busiest I've ever seen Magic Kingdom. I, I would call it a normal day. Yeah. The first like two to three hours were on the slower side. You had the, the couple rides that had the long lines, yeah. but like the walkways, like plenty of social distancing. The hub is is fine. Yep. All of that. And then it progressively got more busy as the day went on. Yep. And the ride times, most park, it's like ride times are high. Then they go down. Like the rest of the day, they're going down. This was like high and then like kept and, getting higher. <laughs> yeah, but but the average wait times are not obscenely high like we're going to talk about it at Hollywood Studios. Um, they're they're manageable. So mm -hmm. since everybody normally has upwards of, you know, 
10 to 14 attractions they want to get on at Magic Kingdom, you are able to do it. But in terms of wait time, the longest we waited all day was 67 minutes for Splash Mountain. Now Splash Mountain is not usually the most popular ride, but they did recently announce that they're gonna be closing Splash Mountain at some point to retheme it to the Princess and the Frog. So everybody is trying to get that last ride in because you don't know when it's gonna close. Um, and that was with two cleaning cycles, which really added a lot of time. So yeah. every two hours, Disney cleans every single ride vehicle on every single ride, and then they send it through the ride without people on it for it to dry. Some of the other wait times, like Peter Pan was posted at 55 and we waited, I think 30. Um, Space Mountain, which was like a must do for us, was 60 and we waited 45. So a lot of them still were cushioned. Yep, takeaways from Magic Kingdom is get there early and know that the wait times are definitely gonna be padded and mm -hmm. manageable crowds. So Magic Kingdom was on a Friday. Uh, the next day, Saturday, was Epcot. Um, and Epcot was a mixed bag of... of some good, some horrible. <laughs> yeah, um, so when it comes to, uh, again, the transportation to Epcot, we were staying at... Caribbean Beach. So our intention was to take the Skyliner there because we were actually having breakfast at the Riviera Resort that morning at Topolino. So you just hop on right at the Riviera, right over to Epcot. Um, after breakfast, we went to the station. The uh, Skyliner was down. Um, but when they do that, Walt Disney World Transportation uh, routes extra buses mm -hmm. to those resorts so people aren't stranded. So they upped the amount of buses. That worked out well. We walked over to the bus station, waited like four minutes for a bus and then got on um, right over to Epcot and got there a good, what, 45 minutes before park yeah, opened? Yeah, 45, 50 minutes before park open. And our strategy for Epcot was different than Magic Kingdom. Magic Kingdom, we said we were avoiding the most popular ride and trying to knock out a couple um, not so popular because or like less Because there's so many to times. do at Magic yeah. Kingdom. For Epcot, you can very easily, even on a decently crowded day, do every single ride at Epcot. So we said we are going to the ride that typically has the longest wait, which is Test Track. And I would argue that you could either do Test Track or Frozen, and that would be a good strategy, especially when you're arriving to the park before it opens. Totally. So we went to Test Track. It said it was going to be... 45. Said it was going to be 45 and we waited... 20. 20. So awesome. not bad for Test Track. Then the second the park opened at 11 a.m. because Epcot was open 11 to 9. Mm -hmm. The second it opened at 11 a.m. it said Test Track's wait was 105 minutes. So very happy that we did it yes. early. The other wait times were cushioned and not bad at all. So for Soaring, which is another popular ride, it said 70 minutes, we waited 30. Um, Spaceship Earth said 40, we waited 10. So everything else was very cushioned, very manageable. Yeah. Um, Frozen did have a steady long line, but we chose not to do that ride. We definitely could have. We weren't at the park till closing. Yep. We could have fit that in. Um, but we did everything else in the park besides Frozen and besides the three Caballeros ride in Mexico for a very good reason. Yes. So that. So if you know Epcot, you know the majority of the rides are in the uh, what is traditionally known as Future Worlds. When you get into the World Showcase, uh, our original intention was to do everything that's going on for the Food and Wine Festival. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very apparent when we went into World Showcase that like something was going to be off compared oh to Future God. World. Um, and that was evident right when we got to Mexico, uh, where it was a 55-minute wait just to get into the Mexico Pavilion. So not even to go to get to La Cava del Tequila, to get on Three Caballeros, to get, just to get into the building was 55 minutes. So that right there was going to be the that tell. That crushed our soul. That crushed our soul because... First thing we do when we get to Epcot, when we a, go to World Showcase, get a margarita. we go inside Mexico, get a margarita at La Cava del Tequila, drink it there, and then get on the Three Caballeros ride. It is tradition. Maybe this is like everybody starting their day off. Let's try to get a little further into World Showcase. Norway, or 
Norway's next, same thing. China, same thing. We find our way all the way to Germany and are like, okay, this is this is awful. This is gonna be an issue. Disney supposedly is part is capping the park at 25% capacity. If that is the case, we have never been to Epcot when it's been over 25% capacity. We finally got in line for something at Italy. It had a very long line, but we were like, at this point we were getting hungry, we were getting thirsty. We were like, all right, let's just get in a line that we know like the food will be good. You were in line for 20 minutes and had moved like one or two spots. Yeah. And the line was ridiculously long. So we, we called it at that point, knowing that we weren't gonna be doing our traditional drinking around the world or even like a lot of the sampling that we wanted to do. So we placed a mobile order at Regal Eagle. We know we could sit down inside in the AC. It was hot out. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Um, so biggest takeaway from Epcot right now is don't, if you're traveling, do not plan to go to Epcot on a Saturday. And I would even extend that to say Friday or Sunday for that matter. Yeah. Go during on a weekday. The only caveat with that is there will be some select booths that won't be open, mm -hmm. at least at the time that we are recording this. If you have to do Epcot on a Saturday or Sunday, just do all the rides and then go to the festival later when some people have left. Like we did a couple of booths like at four, five, six, seven o'clock. It was a lot more manageable. It was yeah. waiting like 10 or 15 minutes for food as opposed to like an hour plus where you're not even in the pavilion that you're trying to order in. Right. So Take this with a grain of salt when you're planning your trip yep, and go on the week uh, go on the weekday that's yeah the best takeaway from that on sunday we headed to hollywood studios we took the skyliner to get to hollywood studios so at the time of our trip you had to be in hollywood studios by park opening in order to be able to attempt a boarding group for rise of the resistance so knowing that we got in line for the skyliner Two hours before park opened. 8, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. We were in line at Caribbean Beach and there were maybe like 20, 25 people in front of us. So mm -hmm. they probably arrived at anywhere between like 7.30, 7.45 if I had to guess. We were in Hollywood Studios at 9.05 a.m. The Skyliner is what gets you in Hollywood Studios before anybody else. So when we were on the Skyliner going over, we could see the line of cars to get in. They weren't letting anybody in yet. So we actually were so lucky. We got to ride Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, which had, we basically would have walked on, but they had technical difficulties. Even with that, we waited 25 minutes. So we did that yeah. ride and then we headed into Galaxy's Edge and we're waiting for Park Open to get a boarding group. So again, hacks for this park is get there um, early, especially if you want to rope drop runaway railway. However, what we experienced is now totally moot because you no longer, Disney just announced, you no longer need to be in the park at opening to get a boarding group. For Rise of the Resistance. So instead of being in the park and having to do it at 10 a.m., the Rise of the Resistance boarding group is going to open at 7 a.m. And as long as you have a ticket and you have a park pass reservation for Hollywood Studios on that day, you can attempt from anywhere on yeah. property. But I think for our experience, I mean, we definitely recognize we were lucky to be able to relatively easily get on Runaway rail Railway, secure mm -hmm. an earlier boarding group for Rise. And then we barely waited for Millennium Falcon right after that. We, yeah. Um, so it was just like, even if we didn't have to be there early because of Rise of the Resistance, I'd still recommend it. And the Skyliner is still the way to get you in the park first. Yep. So that you can maybe knock out two or three things before the crowds actually start rolling in. Yeah. So early is always best. And, and shout out to um, the Disney cast members working the Skyliner station, that system was so flawless. Yep. And because they know how people want to get to Hollywood Studios and there's a level of stress there, but everything was super well managed um, and it's a really great addition to property. But um, crowds at Hollywood Studios. Crowds um, were manageable. Um, definitely. I thought so for Sunday too, we expected the weekend 
big weekend crowd. Definitely the most noticeable in Galaxy's Edge. I would say a good percentage of the park was there. There was definitely a lot of choke points, but walking around any of the other areas, be it Hollywood Boulevard or Sunset or Echo Lake or, you know, uh, Toy Story Land, um, doable. Yeah. Doable. So crowds weren't really an issue and wait times, um, I Pretty think, good. Yeah. For our experience, I mean, like, we're definitely most nervous about this park going into it, but again, all manageable. The park hours were, were decent enough to do pretty much everything we wanted to do. Yeah. And so, like, for example, Tower of Terror, when I went on, was posted 35. I waited 22. Slinky Dog Dash, which we did um, as the last ride of the night before we had to scoot for a dining reservation, that was posted 50 minutes, and we waited 45 which was one of the more accurate times. But considering we didn't get to ride Slinky Dog Dash last time we went because the ride at park opening was 210 minutes and didn't let up all day. Yeah. So the fact that we waited 45 minutes, like 100% worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't mind. That's still less than an hour. Like yeah. for normal Disney times, like... Not bad. Not bad at all. The fourth Disney park we went to was Animal Kingdom. This was on a Monday, the park hours that they were from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we were uh, pretty much the only way you could get there is uh, through Disney Transport is by a bus from the Caribbean beach. So we were in the bus line at 8.15. They were running um, a lot of buses for Magic Kingdom, yeah. so we had to wait a little bit for a bus to Animal Kingdom. Ended up getting to the park and into the gates by 8.50. And our strategy going into this park was to, similar to Magic Kingdom, not going to the most popular ride, which is Flight of Passage in Pandora. Instead, we went to Everest and walked on, then went to Dinosaur and, and walked, walked on. on. <laughs> it was definitely the right strategy. As we were walking into Animal Kingdom, you see just the herd of crowd he heading to Pandora and then like... The rest of the park is Empty. dead for like a good hour, hour and a half. Yep. So that was definitely the right strategy. And then after that, we were like, okay, time for breakfast. We kept an eye on Flight of Passage, the most popular ride in Animal Kingdom all morning. And it was pretty steady up there between like 60 to 90 minutes. And then at lunchtime, it went 35 minutes. We saw that, we ran, and we waited 25, which is insane that ride when we were there last year thankfully we had a fast pass but that was like four hour wait yeah at least um so that was just like that was definitely the right strategy for animal kingdom and we were there on a monday again so um crowd levels not too bad definitely noticed it the most in pandora mm -hmm. where everybody you know, kind of was hanging out, but throughout the rest of the park, you know, really not that bad at right. all. Easily, easy to socially distance, um, and very, and very comfortable for that matter. Yep. And Pandora has, um, like one of the best quick service in the park, Satuli Canteen, and it also had one of the only breakfast spots besides Starbucks at Pongu Pongu. Yep. Um, so that's also why the crowd is so big there is because like that's where some of the best food is. So it was just like, that was definitely the right strategy. Highly recommend it. And then we only rode two other rides that day. Um, the Safari, which was posted at 40 minutes and waited 30. Um, and then obviously rode Flight of Passage. Um, but we didn't do Navi River Journey. We didn't do like the other, like it's tough to be a bug or Triceratops spin. We really enjoyed the atmosphere of Animal Kingdom. We sat and had drinks at um, Nomad Lounge, which we also highly recommend. But this one was... It was definitely the quietest park of the trip. Yeah. Um, all of the rides were manageable, even when you could still ride everything, even when they're at their highest wait times, just because there's not, you know, too much to do at Animal Kingdom. It's definitely doable. Disney Springs. We spent a decent amount of time this trip at Disney Four times. Springs. Yeah. Big takeaways from this is if you were going any day of the week during dinner, it's going to be busy. Definitely bank on needing a dining reservation if you're mm -hmm. going to be at Disney Springs. Don't expect to walk up anywhere. Yeah. Um, but know that it's going to be busy and you're going to have a mix of people who are locals and may not be as accustomed to Disney's safety policies. We definitely saw mass compliance 
a little bit rougher around the edges at Disney Springs as opposed to the theme parks. So just, just expect those crowds. Um, know where you're going so that you're not in a crowd and trying to like find your way. Like use yep. the My Disney Experience app to get directions and just like have a little bit of a game plan. Um, another thing to know about Disney Springs is the buses aren't running to Disney Springs from the parks right now. They just like don't have the bus inventory to be able to do that. So every time we went from a park to Disney Springs for dinner, we took an Uber or a Lyft. Um, you could also take a bus if you wanted to like Saratoga Springs and then walk to um, Disney Springs if, if that's of interest. Last but not least, we have our day at Universal Orlando. Um, to get there, obviously Disney's not providing complimentary transportation. Um, so I, we have booked shuttles in the past through Universal, um, but this time we just didn't wanna be set to any times um, of when we got picked up or when we wanted to leave. So we just took a lift um, and they dropped you off at a special section near City Walk, which is the Disney Springs of Universal in between the two parks of Universal Studios Florida and Islands of Adventure. Um, that is the same place we took an Uber from when we left at the end of the day. We went to Universal Orlando on a Tuesday and the crowds um, were again manageable for the, for the most part. You definitely saw the most crowds just waiting to get in um, in the morning. Um, and at Wizarding World. And at, yes. Of Harry Potter. Both uh, Diagon Alley and uh, Hogsmeade. Uh, choke points for both of those parks so you definitely saw the crowds there but walking around any other area was definitely um manageable um mm -hmm. so overall i would say typical tuesday theme park crowds yeah but it i do think it is the quietest we've ever seen universal wait times for universal um n nothing <laughs> yeah not bad for the most part again it was tuesday so we waited uh, pretty much walked on to jimmy fallon first thing then the, I walked on to Gringotts. Yep. And then, get this, walked on to Hagrid's. Twice! Which, well, I did twice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I need to go get food, so she went the second time. Oh, my God. Wild. It And it said, it said 45 minutes, and we went at lunchtime. We walked on. I was like, what? That's the most padding we saw shocked. for any ride the entire trip. And the longest we waited for a ride... At Universal was um, 30 minutes for the Hogwarts Express. We waited 25 minutes for the Hogwarts Express from Hogsmeade to Diagon Alley and 30 minutes for the reverse trip. That was the longest wait of the day for an attraction. Food is a different story. And this is by, so the biggest takeaway we have from Universal is no going into this that Universal is does, is not on their game when it comes to their mobile, their current mobile order mm -hmm. situation. They need to fix this big time. Part of this was kind of our fault because we chose to go to uh, the Leaky Cauldron during lunchtime. Waited, what was An the- An hour. We, we got in line at 1 p.m., placed the mobile order, and didn't get our food until 2 p.m. Yes. And, and so the, the way they have it set up is... It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense because you need to wait in line to be seated. And then when a team member seats you, you could then go into the app and click prepare my order. So even after you're seated, when you've been waiting an hour, you still need to wait for, for your food, food after that. Whereas in Disney, if you mobile order, you can be out doing anything. You're not waiting for a table. And then it's yeah. they don't let you inside the restaurant until you're orders ready so you could be on a ride you could be shopping yeah and then you get a text that your food's ready and you go in and eat universal it's your loss you have people standing in a line who aren't spending money elsewhere in the park and the kicker to that after we were hungry and waited a while my food came out wrong yep yeah. this was our experience may not necessarily be your experience biggest takeaway if you want to eat at one of the themed restaurants don't do it during peak right have meal, plan meal to times. have lunch at like 3 30 or something and just have snacks during the day breakfast. exactly um because i do think it's still worth eating there if you're a harry potter fan have lunch at the leaky cauldron or at the three broomsticks um, we've eat this is our third time being there. I still think the food is good and I love the atmosphere. So if this is if you're a Harry Potter fan, it's a must-do. Just don't go at one o'clock like we did. 
So that is going to be a wrap for um, the hacks for Disney and a little bit of universal of what people aren't talking about right now. Mm -hmm. Take this as firsthand knowledge and um, this is, we'll just caveat by saying this is accurate as of our trip late October 2020. If you're watching this video at a different time. Things may be different. Yes. To summarize, I would say 100% get to the parks early. Try to leave for the park Two hours in advance, aiming to get to the park an hour in advance. For Magic Kingdom and for Animal Kingdom, avoid the most popular rides in the morning. And for Epcot and Hollywood Studios, go to the most po popular ride in the morning if you're there early. I think that's definitely the good strategy to have going into your trip. And if you guys have any questions about anything that we haven't touched on, let us know in the comments. We'll be happy to answer them. But... That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to this channel, and follow us on social media at A Couple Travelers. Until next time, keep traveling. See ya.